Uh, yes, thank you very much, John. So uh, the next speaker coming up is none other than John Marioni, uh, who is based uh, at the uh, uh, EDI outside of Cambridge and the CRUK Institute in Cambridge. Uh, so looking forward to, to your talk, John. Thank you very much, Martin. Can everybody see my slides? Yes. Martin? Yes, we can see the slides and we see the correct thing. Okay, excellent. So let's just see where that goes. For some reason, the little bar there is in the wrong place, but okay, let's just um, go like this. Okay, so thank you very much for the invitation. I've really enjoyed um, listening to the wonderful talks that we've heard this afternoon or well, this afternoon for me, this morning for you all. And um, it's always fun to speak to such an engaged audience. So looking forward to lots of questions as well. So I thought what I would talk about today is um, some a, a series of problems that all have as a common theme how we take advantage of multimodal single cell data. And so what do I mean by multimodal data? Well, I can mean either multiple single cell RNA-seq experiments that we want to integrate together, but also how we integrate or analyze data when on the same cell you've got multiple features measured, Meramit mentioned two there, TCR and RNA, and we could think about more of those. And then finally, how we integrate different types of single cell data, so not just omics, but also spatially resolved data going all the way back to the talk that Peter gave at the very beginning. So as the first problem, and this is probably the one that's received the most attention over the last um, five or six years, and we could think of this problem as horizontal integration. And this is, an, as an example of this, this would be the integration of multiple independent single cell RNA sequencing data sets. And here the features would be genes, and these would act as anchors so that we could merge the data sets together. So either by computing neutral nearest neighbors, other measures of distances, there's many methods now from Surratt, Harmony, Liger, autoencoder style approaches. There's a lot of work for integrating single cell data sets. And why do we want to do this? Well, by agglomerating, by increasing the number of cells that we can analyze jointly, it gives you more power to identify rare populations of cells. And that's a key challenge if we want to construct comprehensive reference atlases of different cell types. But what I'd like to ask, and this mirrors a little bit what Smita talked about earlier, is what happens following integration? In particular, what happens when you follow integration and you've got multiple samples in different conditions, say a disease and a control setting? Well, in a typical context here, what you'll do is you'll cluster the data jointly. So you'll cluster both the disease and the control cells together. And then with each of those clusters, you'll ask whether there exists differential abundance between mutant and wild type cells. So this is just an example here on the left. You can see data from um, wild type and mutant mice here in this experiment with the wild type in black, the mutant in red. And then what you do is you would take these, all of these cells together, you cluster them into different groups shown here on the right hand side. And then you'd ask within each of these different groups, do I see more um, wild type or mutant cells? And that's what's shown here on the right hand side. However, as Smita already pointed out, this comes with a number of challenges. And in particular, it relies intrinsically upon the definition of discrete clusters. And when you have a continuous process, as you often see in development, but also in other contexts as well, particularly if you have a subtle disease condition relative to a normal, then discrete clusters really don't make sense. So what we wanted to do is to design a better strategy for identifying differentially abundant populations between conditions. And we wanted this to be clustering free, so agnostic to whatever clustering approach you would take. We wanted to be flexible to complex experimental design, so we want to be able to incorporate batch effects continuous covariates such as time, et cetera. And we want to directly model variability in cell numbers between biological replicates. So we want to take advantage of a case in which we have biological replicates. And so in order to do this, um, a student who my co-supervised was Sarah Kreichman, together and Emma Dan, together with a postdoc in my lab, Mike Morgan, came up with this approach that they term Milo. And the idea here is that we want to test for differential abundance on key nearest neighbor graphs. And just to illustrate the approach, it's shown here on the left-hand side, we've got a KNN graph. We've got two conditions, B in white and purple in A. And then basically what you can see here is the, um, how the, the different cells are connected in the graph. And what the asterisks indicate is an index cell. And around that index cell, we're going to construct a neighborhood. And in that neighborhood, we're going to ask, 
do we have differential abundance of cells from condition A and condition B? So we're not going to rely on discrete clustering. We're going to identify intelligently and index cells all along this graph, construct um, effectively hyperspheres around that or neighborhoods around that, and ask within each of those neighborhoods, is there evidence of differential abundance? So conceptually, this um, could simplify to a relatively straightforward problem. We have different neighborhoods, one through to I, and we go the two conditions, A and B, purple and white. And then for each of the replicates assigned to each of these conditions, we can ask within each neighborhood, how many cells come from um, replicate one of condition A and so on. So we just get a fairly standard count matrix. And then we're going to model this using a strategy that's familiar to those of you who do differential expression analysis with RNA sequencing data, bulk RNA sequencing data. So we're going to assume that these counts could be modeled by a negative binomial distribution. And we're going to use a generalized linear model to account for confounding factors or complex experimental designs here. And so we're just going to ask in the simplest case, whether there's a difference in the mean, whether there's a difference in the number of cells from condition A and B within each of these neighborhoods. And now these neighborhoods overlap throughout the graph. So in order to control for multiple testing, we're going to use the spatial false discovery rate. And this accounts for the fact that in some areas of the graph, we're going to have neighborhoods that are more lapping than others. So it allows us to account for this. So um, this is illustrated now in practice on the right-hand side, just for a very simple simulated data set. So again, we've got two conditions, A and B. And you can see that in this region here, where my cursor is here, we've got more cells from condition B than condition E. And that's illustrated in the density plot down at the bottom. And what we do is we just basically construct neighborhoods all the way through this graph. And within each of these neighborhoods, we ask whether there's differential abundance. And if there is indeed differential abundance, we're going to indicate it by this purple color here on the right-hand side. And this particular region is just illustrated in the volcano plot here at the top. And importantly here, standard clustering approaches don't actually identify a discrete cluster in this region of the graph. So if we use these approaches where you start with clustering, and then it looked for differential abundance, this region here would not be identified. Now, in order to benchmark this approach, we generated some synthetic data. So we've taken reals, or you could take a real KNN graph from a real data set. This is from a study of gastrulation that we've worked on in the lab. And then we'll identify regions of this graph where we're going to assume that there's differential abundance of cells between two conditions. And we're going to assume that cells in regions of true differential abundance are those where the probability of a cell coming from condition one is greater than 0.6. And you can see in this middle panel here that this region that I'm circling with my cursor now, this is the region here where we've got differential abundance and where we're going to simulate it. And having found this region, we could then simulate condition labels. So we're going to simulate two conditions here, and we're going to simulate multiple samples from each condition so that each of these cells in the graph is assigned to one of these six samples from these two conditions. And then we could do this for a variety of different simulated settings, and that allows us to benchmark our approach. And so an illustration of the benchmarking is shown here, where we compare the approach termed Milo against these three other approaches. So CIDR is an approach developed for looking for differential abundance of mass spectrometry data. And then DA-seq, another approach for looking for differential abundance. And then the more standard Leuven clustering followed by a GLM approach in the third column. And what you can see here when we look at the true positive rate and the false discovery rate, so basically the power and the um, specificity, we can see that, um, for example, a Leuven clustering approach, so the clustering followed by differential abundance testing, is really not able to control for false discoveries at all well. This contrasts with Milo, where we control false discoveries pretty nicely, and the power, as you would expect, increases as the full change abundance increases. And the other bespoke method that's been developed for this strategy, DA-seq, seems to, um, although it controls false discoveries pretty well, it's actually very underpowered across almost all full changes. So it seems that the approach that we've developed controls the false discovery rate quite nicely and also enables the discoveries of uh, true genuine differences. So in terms of applications, we've applied it to a very nice data set that, um, worked on by collaborators in Edinburgh, the lab of Neil Henderson, and here they looked at um, samples of cells from the liver from five normal and five cirrhotic liver samples. And the full data set is shown here in panel E, together with their annotation of cell types. And the different sample condition labels are shown in panel B, so cirrhotic and normal. And then what we can do is we can construct a KNN graph 
and again identify regions of differential abundance here in panel C. So, for example, we can see that this region here is differentially abundant, and um, so it's more present in the normal cells than in the cirrhotic cells. Um, so that's a, an appealing thing that we've been able to identify here. And we have all other illustrations of the utility of the approach. And this is on a paper that's um, currently under review and that's on the bioarchive. So that's one type of data integration. That's an example of horizontal integration. Another type that I alluded to earlier is vertical integration. And this is an, the types of experiments where we have multimodal measurements made on the same cell. So in this little cartoon, it could be um, DNA methylation, transcription, and chromatin accessibility. So this is, um, if you're able to measure all of these assays on the same cells, then what you want to do is you want to gain power from these different uh, molecular views and integrate them to understand the structure in the data set. And here, instead of features, i.e. genes being the anchors, we've got cells that are the anchors that are going to anchor the integration effort. And this isn't just this um, RNA transcript, um, chromatin accessibility and methylation. It also holds, of course, for the new 10X kit that allows you to look at RNA and chromatin accessibility via a taxi in the same assay. And in order to think about how we might analyze these type of data, my student, Ricard Arshelaguet, um, who worked between me and Oli Stiegel, one of my colleagues in EMDL, um, came up with an approach that he termed multi-omics factor analysis or MOFA. And this effectively is a multi-view factor analysis strategy and just to orient you to what's going on here, each view is going to be a different molecular layer, so RNA expression, DNA methylation, or chromatin accessibility. And what we want to do is to identify the factors that are going to explain the most variability. And if you think of a standard PCA type analysis, what you would do is you would take one of these views, say expression, and then you would identify the different principal components, and these would correspond to the um, vectors that um, explain the most variability in the data set. What a multi-view factor analysis enables you to do is to identify a common set of factors that can explain variability across all of these views simultaneously. So instead of having a PC that just corresponds to the principal axis of variation in gene expression, the first factor here that explains the most variation might explain variation that's common between say the expression and the DNA methylation view. And then we can identify these different factors and they're all going to correspond to different aspects of the data. And then we can interrogate them to understand what's going on downstream. And so to visualize the output here, we can decompose these factors by understanding how much variation they explain in each of these different molecular views. So in this little cartoon here, the first factor here explains a lot of variation in the RNA expression and chromatin accessibility views. But for example, we can also have factors that explain variation that's unique to one of the views. So factor four here only explains variation in the transcription, the RNA expression layer. And then analogous to PCA or other factor analyses approaches, we can use these factors to visualize the relationship between the cells in space. And we can inspect the feature loadings, what genes do the factors correspond to, what enhancer elements do they correspond to in order to interpret their meaning. So in terms of applications, we've been working together with the lab of Wolf Reich and other colleagues in Cambridge to apply these multi-view factor analysis techniques to try and understand something about the regulation and the molecular regulation that underpins early development in the mouse. And I'm going to focus on this as a model system for the remainder of the presentation. So I'll just orient you to it here. So E here stands for embryonic day, and we're going to go from embryonic day four and a half, so four and a half days post-fertilization which corresponds to implantation around the time that the embryo implants. And we're going to go through to a little bit later than the four somite stage. So we'll go a little bit later than that at around, um, oops, I've gone the wrong way, around E8.25, E8.5. And so this is a key stage in development. It's when the basic body plan is laid down. And when the embryo moves from a fairly homogeneous population or at least a homogeneous looking population of cells in the canonical cup shape here, through to the vestiges of an embryo that's going to be much more similar to the actual adult animal. And so together with the lab of Wolf Reich at the Babraham, we developed this SENMT seq technology that allows chromatin accessibility, DNA methylation and transcription to be measured in the same cell. We've been looking at the data towards the earlier part of this process from embryonic day four and a half through to embryonic day seven and a half. And this isn't yet a very high throughput technique, 
such as the 10x system, but it does have this unique advantage that we have all of these views on the same cells. So here, this is real data now, and we've got these four time points. And importantly, we've got expression, methylation, and accessibility, and cells can be matched across these different views. So we have expression, methylation, and chromatin accessibility measured on the same sets of cells. So how do we make sense of these data? Well, having developed MOFA, we applied it to the E7.5 data, so the latest time point we had. And here we were trying to understand what were the molecular features, the genomic features that would define the primary germ cell lineages, so ectoderm, endoderm, and mesoderm. And so this is a, a MOFA plot, a summary plot from MOFA that we get here. And what we can see here are the first six factors that explain a lot of variation in the data set. And we can see that the first factor corresponds to the mesoderm and the second to cells that correspond to the endoderm. But more interestingly, what we observed when we defined the elements of interest as either distal enhancer marks or proximal promoter marks, we can see that the types of marks that are defining the mesoderm and the endoderm lineages and the ectoderm lineages are corresponding to changes in enhancer. So in particular, demethylation and changes in accessibility and enhancers rather than the promoters. So it seems that there's not much going on in terms of promoters or active transcription sites that's underpinning whether a cell is committed towards a mesoderm or an endodermal lineage. It's really changes in enhancer usage, and that's dictated by changes in methylation and accessibility at those enhancers. So demethylation and accessibility of thousands of enhancers define lineages, but how do these patterns arise in time? And so to illustrate this, I'm going to focus um, first on ectodermal cells at E7.5. And in particular, we're going to use ChIP-seq of HDK27 acetylation. This is a marker of active enhancers to define germ layer specific enhancers. So what I'm showing in this panel here on the top right-hand side here are cells that correspond to the ectoderm. And then, and that's been dictated by their transcriptional profile. And then we're going to look at methylation in red and chromatin accessibility at ectoderm endoderm and mesoderm specific enhancers respectively. And as you might expect, when we look at these ectoderm defined cells, so they're defined as ectoderm again on the basis of their transcriptome, we can see that ectoderm specific enhancers are demethylated and they are accessible. And this contrasts with endoderm and mesoderm enhancers, which are um, they're, um, methylated and inaccessible, so they're not being used. But what if we go to cells that are defined as mesoderm or endoderm on the basis of their transcriptome. Well, here, if we focus on the middle panel and look at mesoderm cells, we can see that indeed mesodermal enhancers are demethylated and accessible, but actually there's pretty substantial demethylation and accessibility for ectoderm enhancers as well. And the same is seen for the endoderm down at the bottom. So what if we now go back earlier in development and at these time points, these earlier time points, these cells transcriptionally are extremely homogenous, but very strikingly, what we can see is that at E5 and a half or E6 and a half, when we transcriptionally cannot distinguish these cells at all, we can see that endoderm and mesoderm enhancers that are used at E7.5 are methylated and inaccessible, so they're not being used. But these ectoderm enhancers that are used quite specifically at E7.5, and indeed some of them a bit later in development, they are demethylated and accessible. And this also holds to a certain extent as we move even earlier in development through to E4.5. So what does this mean? Well, this seems to mean that ectoderm specific enhancers are marked at the earliest time point we've studied, E4.5, and they don't undergo the same global waves of repression as endoderm and mesoderm specific enhancers, with these endoderm and mesoderm specific enhancers in turn being activated later on in development in a much more specific way. And this establishes a hierarchical epigenetic model for how the primary germ layers are established, where we start, start with a population of cells that are transcriptionally homogenous at E4.5, but where the um, ectodermal enhancers are protected from global waves of methylation, establishing a default state, where if you just take these cells and let them differentiate by default without any external cues, they'll move towards an ectodermal identity. And you have to make an active decision for these cells to commit to other lineages, either the endoderm and the mesoderm. And for those of you who work with a mouse, this makes sense because you could take mouse embryonic stem cells. If you just differentiate them, 
they have a tendency to move towards a neuronal lineage. And this we think is probably explained by this marking of specific enhancers early on in development and their protection from the global waves of methylation. So this might well underpin that observation. So that's two types of integration, horizontal and vertical. And of course, we've been looking at this um, gas relation process, not only with this SCNMT-seq data, but also with more canonical SmartSeq and 10x technologies, generating atlases of the cell types that are present through this process. But all of these data, the RNA-seq and the multiomics data, miss a key component. And this comes really back to Peter's talk right at the beginning, and that's the spatial dimension. They can provide unbiased molecular profiles, but the spatial context, as Peter said, really matters because the cell-cell signaling, mechanical, physical constraints, these really are also going to dictate what cells do. Now, of course, especially for processes such as mouse development, there exist uh, powerful in-situ databases, for example, that developed in Edinburgh, but they're limited by the lack of a common scaffold. Um, you can only typically probe the expression of two or three genes in parallel at once within the same embryo. And also the immunofluorescence approaches typically don't quite have single cell resolution. And when you have many cells that are compact tightly and many heterogeneous developmental processes, you really do need this single cell resolution in order to really understand what's going on. And so to address this, we've been working more recently with the lab of Long Tai at Caltech, who is one of the developers of these um, spatially resolved transcriptomics technologies, in particular, the SeekFish approach. And here, I won't go into detail, but the way that I think of this, and I think conceptually it's pretty much um, what goes on here, is that instead of looking um, at the expression of a single molecule at cellular or subcellular resolution, as you would with traditional um, single molecule RNA fish, what we do is we scale that up to looking at the expression of dozens or hundreds of genes in parallel using clever combinatorial indexing strategies. And that's really what underpins these seekfish or murfish like technologies. It's the combination and of different genes being enabled by the presence of different um, barcodes that allows you to look at multiple of these genes in parallel. And so this isn't an unbiased approach. We have to decide what genes to prove. And actually, this is not a trivial problem in and of itself. So in the experiment that I'm going to talk about, we were able to look at the expression of 351 genes. And how do we go about choosing these? Well, this is the 10x atlas of early development that I briefly mentioned earlier. And what we did, or a student in my lab, Johnny Griffiths did, was that he looked for markers of individual cell types and the minimal number of markers for individual cell types that he could identify, um, and then ensured that these genes were not expressed too highly, because if they're expressed too highly, then that makes it difficult to um, tease apart the different dots when you do the imaging. So you want good genes that characterize different processes, cell types, gradients, et cetera, but you also want these genes to be lowly to moderately expressed. So I think that there's quite a lot of work going on, and indeed Peter is also and his lab doing work on this at the moment, as for mine, but I, um, you're going to have to take me for the word here that we designed a panel of 351 genes and that it was a vaguely sensible panel to choose. Having designed that panel, we've applied it to different stages of development. I'm just going to focus on one stage for the remainder of this presentation, and that's the 8 to 12 somite stage. So in the context of embryonic days, this is between embryonic day 8.5 and, and embryonic day 8.75. About Tim Lohoff, the experimentalist who did the work here is, did, is he went to the lab of Long Kai in Caltech and he um, took various embryos and within each embryo he took a sagittal section which is indicated here on the left hand side and you can see the sagittal view here and then he applied seekfish to these sagittal sections and he did this independently for three distinct embryos and the three embryos that we used are shown on the right hand side and these red boxes here correspond to the fields of view in which the expression of these 351 genes were proved. So there's a large number of challenges um, computationally here. Peter already touched on the challenges with segmentation and assigning these dots to particular cells. In this um, experiment here, we were able to take advantage of specific staining for cell membranes using a panel of four specific membrane markers, and then to um, use the machine learning approach, Elastic, developed by my EMBL Heidelberg colleague, Anna Kreshuk, in order to segment these images. And so what you can see on the right-hand side here is a zoom-in of one field of view with the membrane stain shown in purple and the segmentation mask that we get out 
of this uh, machine learning approach here shown on the right top right panel. And then we can zoom in on any one of these. These are the individual dots. And then what we effectively get is a segmented image. And within each of these segments, we can count the number of molecules that correspond to these 351 genes, giving us a spatially indexed expression matrix. So what does the data look like? Well, here's the expression of 12 marker genes that we looked at. So this is just in one embryo now. And the first couple of panels here where the cursor is, we're looking at markers of the heart. And indeed, they are expressed in the region of the embryo where the heart is located, various neuronal markers in the middle, and on the bottom right, markers of the gut tube. So it seems that this is all working quite nicely. But the real power of this experiment comes from the fact that we profiled all of these genes together in parallel. And how are we going to take advantage of that? Well, the first thing that we wanted to do was to take these segmented images and assign each of these segments a cell type identity. And we could do this agnostically, just using this set of 351 genes and employing a random field style clustering strategy. But actually, we reasoned that we would have more power to assign um, grand, better granularity of cell type labels by integrating the SeqFish data together with the independently generated single cell RNA sequencing data that I briefly described earlier. And in order to do this, we built upon an approach that we developed in the lab quite a few years ago now, where we used mutual nearest neighbors, this concept of mutual nearest neighbors, to integrate single cell RNA sequencing data sets. So what we did was in the 10X Atlas, we subsetted it down to the same set of 351 genes that were probed in SeqFish. And then for each SeqFish cell, we asked what were its set of nearest neighbors in the 10X Atlas. And having identified that, we then asked what were those set of nearest neighbors, what cell type were these nearest neighbors assigned to the sun identity, and use transfer learning to map that label over to the SeqFish data. And so this is a plot of the two data sets, the 10X and the SeqFish data on the same um, reduced dimensionality scale. And this allows cell type identity to be generated for each cell in the SeqFish experiment. We could then overlay this, of course, in space where it looks much more impressive. So we got cells from the ectoderm on the left, this is the brain, and you can see that indeed they are a side of forebrain, midbrain, hindbrain identity, mesodermal cell types, the heart and this um, magenta color in the middle, and the endoderm here, where we've got um, the cells lining the gut tube. So this is the anterior to posterior axis of the gut tube. And also, although I won't talk about it today, we can look at this um, labeling from anterior to posterior, the relationship with the surrounding splenic mesoderm, and understand cell signaling interactions between cell types that are adjacent to one another. And so this allows visual discrimination here between spatially coherent and diffuse cell types, and also, of course, enables a lot of downstream statistical analysis. But we don't want to be limited to just 351 genes. We're quite greedy in that sense. So we also thought, could we extrapolate, could we impute the expression of the remaining genes? And again, we're going to use the idea of the mutual nearest neighbors. So for each SeqFish cell, we're going to map it again back to the 10x data set, and then having identified its 10 nearest neighbors, we can, for each gene, average its expression in a weighted manner across the nearest neighbors and use that as the imputed expression for all of the genes. So not limited to those 351 genes that we proved, but enabling us to look at expression for genes right across the transcriptome. And we showed um, using simulations that our approach yields comparable performance to imputing data between independent single cell RNA-seq experiments, but more powerfully, we actually have independent validation. So as well as looking at these 351 genes, we also looked at 36 genes in the same embryos using independent single molecule RNA fish. So just probing each gene one at a time. And so what we can do is we can use these genes, which were not used in any of the analyses that I've described previously, and compare their imputed expression with the true expression. And the imputed expression for six example genes is shown at the bottom here, and the true expression from SM fish is shown at the top. And you can visually see immediately that there's really good concordance between the imputed expression values and the true expression, both for cell type specific markers, such as NKX25 that marks the heart, but also for positive control genes, such as BSP1 that's expressed everywhere, and negative control genes, such as UTF1. And this really suggests that our imputation strategy is both specific and sensitive. So how can we use it? Well, we can zoom in on a particular region of the embryo. Here, we're going to zoom in on a particular region of the brain. And we've um, 
further subcluster this to get a better resolution of cell types here. In particular, we're going to zoom in on the midbrain hindbrain boundary region. We can then zoom in further. We can manually annotate the midbrain hindbrain boundary here, which is indicated where my cursor is. And to do that, we used the expression of OTX2 and GBX2, which are markers of the midbrain and hindbrain respectively. And having done that, we can then use classical differential expression analysis to identify genes that are differentially expressed between the two regions, between the hindbrain on the left and the midbrain on the right-hand side, enabling us to go up from the expression, looking at the expression of 351 genes in a spatial context, to look at the expression of tens of thousands of genes within a spatial context. So that's all I wanted to say today. I've talked to you about different approaches for integrating multimodal data, whether it be different single cell RNA-seq experiments, whether it be um, multimodal experiments where on the same cell, we're looking at multiple assays. I think moving forward, we're going to have other challenges where there's diagonal integration, no anchors, mosaic integration, where we have different types of um, data measured on different populations, which is going to be very challenging. And also we're going to want to be comparing trajectories across species, incorporating genetic data. There are all sorts of opportunities and challenges here, I think, when we think about multimodal data integration. I think this is probably from a computational biologist's perspective, one of the most exciting areas of active research at the present time. And with that, I'd like to acknowledge my lab members. Um, I have a fantastic um, lab. I, it would be invidious to single out any of them. They are all fantastic and it's a pleasure to work with all of them. I have great collaborators both in Cambridge and internationally. And at the bottom here are a list of um, ex lab members, both in my lab and in the labs of collaborators who've contributed tremendously to the work I presented today. And of course, the various organizations that have funded my work, I'm very grateful to them for all the support they give me. And of course, most importantly of all, I'm really grateful to you for your attention. I know these Zoom seminars can be quite challenging to concentrate through. So thank you very much for attending today. And I look forward to answering any questions that you might have. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, John. Uh, that was a great talk. So we're running a little bit over time here. Uh, so I will take a question from, from Scott Tyler here. So he has the temporal aspect of the multi-view approach in the differenti differentiation data sets is really cool. Have you tried to build something like a Bayesian, Bayesian frame network or to use manifold positions uh, along a walk or flow vector to try to find causal relationships uh, between the views? Yes, that's a great question. Um, so yes, the answer is we have attempted to do that. I think that the um, it's still quite early days. There's a very interesting question about lag. I think when you're inferring causal relationships between the views. So if you think about um, say a pseudo time ordering, you'll have a change in expression. And does that is that preceded by a change in chromatin accessibility? or do changes in chromatin accessibility come after? And what is the lag between the two views? And so when you're thinking about this in a temporal aspect, I think a key question is to try and um, both determine what that lag might be and also what, whether the patterns of changes might be consistent. So for example, in the work I talked about with Wolf, the change in chromatin accessibility really precedes the change in expression actually come quite a lot, hello, you have a little guest, Martin. Um, um, so it really precedes the change in expression by quite a lot, by three days. And I think there, it would be quite difficult with the other types of information we have going backwards almost to infer causal relationships. So I think that um, it's a great question. It's something we're working on. I don't think we have a um, perfect answer to this at present. So it's a, but it's a really good question. And that, that question of lag is one that I think is really important to get right. Right. Uh, thank you very much for, uh, for that uh, answer, John. So I think we will take a lunch break now, uh, depending on your time zone. And so we will be starting at uh, 125 um, Eastern uh, time again, uh, which you again, you have to uh, uh, do some uh, basic arithmetics to figure out what, what that corresponds to wh where you are. And um, so I'd like to thank uh, John and, and all the other panelists for great talks, and I'm looking forward to, to a very exciting afternoon session as well. Thank you very much.